Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Chris Capps, and with me is composer Stephen Lias. I want to welcome you all to and invite you to submit questions on Facebook, on the event post, or on Livestream's main page. Uh, you also should know that captions are provided for those who need them on the park website, and that address is www.nps.gov slash dina slash events dot htm. So I run a nonprofit here in the Denali area called Kids in Motion, and we are very proud to be part of a consortium of community groups called Denali Arts and Humanities Alliance, and that includes Denali National Park and Alaska Geographic, and we support the arts. So we are very excited to have Stephen Lias here. Uh, Stephen was uh, the first composer in Denali, I believe, and then he's been back here every year since, uh, 2012, after his uh, time here in 2011, to run a class inviting other composers. So, why do you keep coming back? Well, for the same reason that anyone comes back to Denali, it is an inspiring and, uh, maybe move my mic back up here, it's a location that, uh, that inspires you. You come here and you are overwhelmed by your own <laughs> sense of smallness and by the nature and by the geology it's it's quite a remarkable place and as composers of course we're always looking for inspiration and so that inspiration that we get in the park can easily become music for us I keep coming back also because of people like you because of the receptivity of the park administration here to the arts and to integrating those arts into what they do uh, so it's, uh, it's been a real magical fit for me. Once I came here the first time, I knew I'd be back repeatedly. And why do you think it's important that this inspiration of wilderness be translated into music? I mean, we have a lot of photos of Denali National Park. People can enjoy it personally. Sure. There, there are probably two good reasons for that. One is more from the composer's standpoint, and that is that music... Many, many of the arts are abstract or can be abstract at the, compose, at the artist's discretion, but music is inherently abstract. And so the thing we go to music for is that it expresses the inexpressible. And when we go into the park, we feel pretty regularly the inexpressible, fear or uh, wonder, I mean, in ways that it's very difficult to put into words. But, it's, but music can be a really perfect vehicle for expressing that. We see that in movies. Why do we have movie scores at all? We could use words to describe things or pictures, but the music heightens that experience in such a, a profound way. And I know it would be difficult for you to explain this in a very short time, but how do you do it? How does that work? How do you translate that feeling of um, excitement or fear, as you mentioned? Sure. There are lots of ways. There are certain instruments that people naturally associate with certain mm. things. And so if you think of uh, maybe a, a moose would, would evoke a, a lumbering, sort of slow, lilting rhythm with a low instrument like maybe a bassoon or a clarinet. Uh, so there are certain associations that people already have that we can capitalize on. Uh, and then uh, for me, I'll often look to certain certain aspects of the experience, what, it, what words are going through my head and can those become music or are there shapes or colors that I'm looking at that can become music. Very recently I wrote a piece about Glacier Bay National Park and there's this amazing skyline of mountains over there on, uh, on the Fairweather Range that I, I drew a, an outline of mountains and made that into the melody shape that I used in the piece. So an actual shape that I was looking at became a musical line going up and down as the shape went up and down. So those are some of the ways. You know, nature is always moving, so if you think of water undulating or flowing, music can easily do those, imitate those sorts of movements. Well, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how uh, your direction ended up being at the national parks. Sure. Well, I was, uh, in, my, in my 30s, I discovered sort of a latent interest in all things adventure and wildernessy. I hadn't done any of that as a, as a younger man, but um, I started backpacking and kayaking and things like that and discovering a love for that. And then it was in 2009 that I first tried to combine that love with my professional life, which was composing, and I, and I applied for a Guggenheim Foundation grant 
um, to uh, to go to major national parks, write music about those experiences, and um, and I didn't get that grant. But as a result of having written that proposal and thought, thinking through how perfect that would be for me to combine all my interests, that started me down the path. And so I started writing smallish pieces about various parks, about Big Bend or Kings Canyon or Rocky Mountain. Then I started getting some actual residencies at the parks and the pieces got bigger. Wrote a bigger piece about Mount Rainier, a bigger piece about Denali. Mm -hmm. um, and now they've grown to full size pieces. This last year has seen band pieces and orchestra pieces premiered, uh, many of them about Alaska parks. So. And can you talk a little bit about how um, music from parks is actually part of our culture that people are not even aware of? Sure. Um, the most famous example of that, well, no, I've got to say two. The, the, the old famous example is, um, some people listening may remember the piece of music goes boom, prum, boom, prum, boom, prum, boom, prum, boom, 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 boom. That's uh, a little excerpt, from, beautifully sung excerpt from Ferdy Grofe's Grand Canyon Suite, which is one of the most famous pieces of orchestra music that still gets played a lot. Mm -hmm. And each movement captures some aspect of the Grand Canyon experience. There's a cloud burst and the on the trail and uh, sunrise. But then I also would be remiss not to mention that the winner of the Pulitzer Prize in music this year is John Luther Adams. Yes, we're very excited about that. <laughs> yeah, as well you should be. And his music is deeply, deeply intertwined with his Alaska experience, mm -hmm. the, the, the decades of living here in Alaska, experiencing wilderness in particular. Uh, and so it's, those are two really important examples of classical composers who have been deeply related to wilderness and to national parks in particular. Well, and then this, um, this expanded beyond Stephen Lias. Yes, and it, partly because of you and my visit here in 2011, I served as the park's first art, er, composer in residence. And um, as a result of that, we've been able to start a few other projects going that are really remarkably unique. Uh, the Denali Music Festival was begun as a forum for us to showcase right. the first piece that I had written. That was in 2012. And so we're now in our third year, about to have the third Denali Music Festival. And this year, we'll be premiering two pieces as part of that concert that were written by composers who have done this other thing that we started, which is um, we cooked up this amazing idea, you, me, and Denali National Park, and the... Uh, the Murray Science and Learning Center, where we're sitting right now, as well as the Fairbanks Summer Arts right. Festival. We all came to the table and came up with the idea of doing a class for composers in the park. We call it Composing in the Wilderness, and there is nothing like it anywhere else in the world. And there have been students from all over the world. Yes, we've had, over the, over the course of the three years we've done it, we've had three different participants from Australia. I have, I have some good contacts in Australia, so That's I think great. that helps. <laughs> we've also uh, had one participant from Sweden, and then participants from all corners of the lower 48, most of whom have never been to Alaska before. And all ages, too. All I ages, have. yes. Uh, as young as about 20 years old, mm -hmm. up through you know, mature professional composers. Uh, and so that we take them into the park, and they experience the park, the amazing inspiration that they find there. And they start to form ideas about what music they will write about that. And then we take them to another Alaska park, Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, where we provide them with creative time to work on the pieces for four days. Then we fly them back to Fairbanks and hook them up with professional musicians, and they get played right away. And when they're composing, they're not on their laptops out in the wilderness. No, while we're here in the park, we tell them to leave their composers at the park entrance, or leave their computers right. at the park entrance, and instead we give them all music, paper, and pencils. And for the younger composers, that's often the first time they've ever composed a <laughs> piece bet. using I'll a pencil, bet. which is quite unusual <laughs> for them. The older composers, it's back to basics for them. Right, but right. Yeah, it, I think that is... Uh, an important part of the creative experience here. We know that the park, being in any national park, Denali in particular, helps us sort of shut off the procedural email answering, phone answering, mm -hmm. cooking, meal shopping kind of part of our brain and puts us in a more creative, fluid space. And we find that using, compo when we give composers a pencil and paper, 
they're able to maintain that creative flow in a very natural sort of in touch with nature way that the computer ultimately um, undermines. So. so now two of those pieces that have been composed in the past three years are going to be performed here at Denali on Saturday, July 19th. That's right. By the Fairbanks Summer Arts Festival Orchestra. And what are those pieces? I, I don't have the titles mm -hmm. at, uh, in my head right now, but they are by uh, last year's composer, Samuel Hunter, who's based in Houston. Um, and the previous year, a composer named Ken McSparrett, who's originally from Texas and is now in Oklahoma, both of those, we made an open call to all of the alumni of our nice. Composing in the Wilderness <laughs> program and asked them to submit pieces for us to consider programming on this concert. And we got a, a wonderful array of pieces, some of which we may program next year or the following mm -hmm. year. Um, and uh, Robert Franz and Teresa and I sort of sat down and, and evaluated them all and selected these two. And then a third piece that was right, submitted was okay. so mm -hmm. good that we decided that it needed to go on the uh, the concert that the Fairbanks Summer Arts Festival does in Fairbanks on the 26th with the full Fairbanks Summer Arts Festival Orchestra. And that's by Justin Rawls, who is from the Pacific Coast. He, I think he's from Oregon originally, but he's going to school in California right now. Mm -hmm. So does this seem to be a trend? Um, I hope so. I mean, it's building here, and it seems like other parks are embracing it. Uh, they are none to the degree that Denali is. I would, I, I cannot undersco underscore enough how unique this is. There, are, from the composer standpoint, there are lots of places a composer could go for a summer workshop for two weeks where they write a piece and it gets performed. That's not uncommon. None of those places have a wilderness experience attached to it mm -hmm. as inspiration. And from the park standpoint, many parks have artists in residence programs. Some of which are open to composers, but um, but none quite to the degree that Denali has. And I want to point out when the composers are here, they're not just hiking, they're also talking to researchers. Right, we arrange to have a scientist with us for most of their visits. So um, they've over the years they've visited with uh, soundscape scientists and biologists and uh, uh, geologists. So their pieces, we find, we'll have one composer write a piece that's inspired by uh, by plate tectonics and how the mountains wow. <laughs> in this region were formed. And another composer will write a piece about predator-prey relationships. And another piece will write a uh, another composer will write a piece about a, a tiny, tiny flower in the middle of an alpine tundra. So having scientists along helps focus their minds on the, all the facets of this environment and all the ways of seeing it. And how often is it that a composer can put something on paper and then boom, a few days later, hear it performed? It's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. And to do so in a big metropolitan city it, it is not too difficult. But to do so in Alaska, where we are doing it in the wilderness and then coordinating with many organizations, it's really remarkable that all the forces came into place. And I want to return to one, at the very beginning you asked me why I do this, and there were two reasons, and I never mm -hmm. got to say the second, and it's good to bring it up now. And the second one is because of, is seen from the parks standpoint. Mm -hmm. Parks have entire divisions of their staff called interpretive rangers, whose job it is, is to help the public understand the park that they're experiencing. So they have exhibits, they have rangers give talks about wildlife, they have these sorts of things happening all over the park. And music is this amazing tool for interpretation for reaching a new wider audience. If, if these composers write pieces about caribou or about plate tectonics and then take those pieces to North Carolina and New York and Texas and California, those pieces get performed with this inspiration still connected to them. Those composers right. get up and talk to those audiences about the wildlife, the geology. And, and so they carry the interpretive mission of the park service out beyond its boundaries to people who might never visit the park. So music is a wonderful vehicle from that perspective. And as too. we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act, that seems especially appropriate. <laughs> it is. I've tried to arrange a bunch of performances of my pieces during 2014 mm -hmm as part of that celebration and in fact in September the the uh, Gates of the Arctic piece is going to get premiered yes. by the Boulder Philharmonic and in the program it says as you know presented as part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness wow. Act so and of course we're already out of time of course we are so um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in this is going to be archived so you can uh, tune in and watch it at your convenience 
and um, you are certainly welcome to hear Stephen at the Denali Education Center tonight at 7 and at the Mary Science and Learning Center tomorrow, Wednesday, also at 7. Looking forward to it. Thank you.